Do you struggle with seeing eye to eye with your spouse about your personal goals and dreams? Do you and your spouse sometimes have conflict around how much you work or the idea of you pursuing anything else because you are a busy mom? Well, I am so excited to welcome you to the Possibility Mom Live. <laughs> this <laughs> Welcome to the Possibility Bob Live, where we will one day be exceptional at the technology involved in running a live show. I'm so excited to um, be here with you because this topic is near and dear to my heart. And so we are gonna just jump right into it. Let me know in the comments if this is a topic, navigating dreams with your spouse, getting into conflict because you want to pursue um, something uh, perhaps outside of the regular duties of motherhood, let me know if the pursuit of dreams together as a couple in marriage is something that you are navigating um, and we are going to have a really candid chat. All righty. So if you are not familiar with our story, my husband, Josh Canning, worked in the Catholic church world for a very long time. He was a campus minister on two different university campuses. He was a, um, uh, he then afterwards worked in evangelization in a couple of different avenues. And we also have taken turns where I was the primary breadwinner and he stayed home and watched the kids. And of course he was the primary breadwinner and I stayed home and primarily watched the kids. But throughout our entire marriage, I have worked. I have worked in interior design, for about 10 years of my career working in television as well as with private clients. And then I have worked um, in the space that I'm in now, which is currently uh, earning us primarily, I am the primary breadwinner. If I did not show up to things like this, there would be no money <laughs> coming into our bank account. So I am now the primary breadwinner in our family and my husband is providing primary care for our small children who are home during the day. And it is all kinds of fun. So just to give you some context, that is what we are playing with. And I'm just so excited to welcome my husband, the, the man, the legend, the man with the glorious beard. How are we doing this? Are you coming on? Are you sitting here? Are you going yeah, on? Welcome to the Possibility Mob, my husband, Josh Canning. Da -da 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 Hello. Oh my goodness, glorious beard. Hey. Everybody, look at the glorious. I got, I got it trimmed this week, so it's a little bit tamed. Glorious beard. So just full disclosure, we are doing this live show with no child care, mm -hmm. hoping <laughs> our child, our smallest child will remain sleeping yeah. and our other children will allow Umi Zumi yeah. to be. They could get unruly. We'll see. I mean, we'll see. Because normally just, I'm the buffer zone between the children and Lisa during I mean, the show. You know, usually bouncing one while managing <laughs> graphics and bringing in music. But we'll see how it goes. So, honey, what do you wish everybody knew about being married and chasing dreams? Mm. That's a really great, broad question. I guess the first thought is that uh, marriage itself is an adventure. Um, and I think of our own uh, journey up to this point, it's had many different hills and valleys, you know, it cannot, it, at times it can feel like it's um, the hardest thing in the world, um, raising a family, and at times it can feel like it's the greatest um, thrill in the world. So I would say, first and foremost, that's, you know, it, it's an adventure, and adventure has, has both uh, the, the easier periods and the harder periods, and that's okay. That's a good thing. And it doesn't mean your marriage is wrong because it, it's hard at times. I guess that's the first thought. Um, with regards to pursuing dreams, I think we live in a really unique time where we don't have to sit in certain cookie-cutter roles uh, to provide for ourselves and for our loved ones. 
Um, we often don't have to farm. Um, you mm -hmm. know, we don't have to do some other more traditional roles. I don't have to go to a uh, factory and work a nine to five. You know, mm -hmm. I have done nine, nine to, a lot of nine to five jobs, but um, we live in a time of great uh, opportunity and possibility to um, explore what where our passions lie and um, what it means to pursue those and provide for our families. So it's time for great creative uh, opportunities. But I also think that this has made everything a lot harder. Mm. So I jump into this a little bit in my book, The Possibility Mom, and I'll link these videos in the description below. When I was doing a little bit of research for my book, I came upon a series of YouTube videos by about five moms. They all kind of, been, did you just? Do you have to draw attention to it? Like just, <laughs> I'm drinking carbonated water. Give me a break. It makes me a little bit gassy. At least it went like in that direction. Whoa. The next one will not. Oh my gosh, Josh. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so on YouTube, a series of videos by about five YouTubers, they all banded together to create these day in the life videos, but in different eras of history. So there was like a 1950s mom, a 1960s mom, 70s, and so on. Um, and I'll link those below. But it was fascinating because they 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 had to be committed. That was the other interesting thing. You had to be committed to wearing the costumes, wearing, you know, like they, they followed to the letter what would have been typical and accurate for that time period. And what I found most interesting, and do not get mad at me in the comments, I'm just making an observation, okay? But what I found most interesting was that the 50s, 60s, 70s moms did not work, typically. And again, they're obviously playing like a role, but like in the videos that they were portraying, they didn't work. So they were able to have dinner on the table, a very clean home, even clean children. Like some of them talked about how in books from that era, it was like recommended that make sure your kids are clean when your husband comes home, mm. okay? So my observation in these, you know, again, are these like historically accurate videos. Obviously these are just, not just, but these are YouTubers who are doing a cool piece of content, right? But they, they, they shared, it was fascinating. They shared the research that they did and how they would have a drink ready when their husband came home and dinner and all those kinds of things. Yeah. And my observation was that it was peaceful. Mm. But then the 80s and 90s moms, the way that these, again, you know, YouTubers, actors were, were playing, portraying that role was they were getting home from work and it was chaos. So meaning, and again, I'm just, nobody get mad at me in the comments. I'm just making an observation mm -hmm. from this interesting YouTube mm -hmm. experience right. where they're walking in the door. They're literally warming up microwave dinners. The house is trashed. Like what I think has happened as a result of women entering the workforce, again, nobody get mad or you're welcome to get mad, but I'm just saying um, what I think has happened is we kind of forgot about what the impact would be of two parents working, right? So what happens in that Keep case, who puts dinner on the table? Who puts like, who picks up the kids from school? How do you, things like cleaning the house and all those things get done. I think what's happened is there was kind of like, oh yeah, oopsies. Like it's like, we've empowered all these women to go to work, but oopsie daisies. We've also kind of forgot how to have the conversation of, well then how does all this other stuff happen that used to happen when a mom in the fifties and sixties more typically stayed home? I think it's a valid question to ask. And it's a question that I really put forward in my book, The Possibility Mom. I discuss this all the time. To me, do I think women should work? Like, I think some women are super called to work. I'm one of them. I think some women are super duper um, uh, called is the phrase that I use. Like they, they, they are meant to do something that will impact the world. We're called to impact our families. But I do believe that there are some, we're all called to impact the world. Anyway, but my point is, we cannot forget this very specific question is if we have two parents who are working, who is doing the work that would have been historically done 
by a mother who did not work and primarily took care of the home and the children. Mm -hmm. What do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, so another one thing comes to mind is I saw I saw a stat. It was like in the um, 1910s, you know, up in 1910 to 1920. Um, apparently, it was something like in American households, 15% had full-time uh, care helping them out. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily a very rare thing there. So that's one perhaps way that in which you can uh, divvy up labor by bringing in uh, outdoor support. Um, I think what you're hitting on with your question and your observation is interesting in that um, obviously there was there was a change in uh, industry and economy from the 60s onward. You know, many more women entering the workforce um, and challenging of gender roles, uh, I would say. Um, I think there's a way to do that healthily and a way to do that that's not helpful in the long run. And that's what we were, I guess, seeing in some, some people in the 80s. They were finding in their families, it's like, well, we were told we could do it all. Um, but it's actually really hard to raise kids and also maintain careers. So what the heck? And so I think we ask the wrong question in my humble opinion. It's not about should a mom work in my humble opinion. I think the question needs to be more like how do we maintain peace in the home? Mm -hmm. Or is there another question? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe another question would be, how do we have the best holistic impact in the areas that matter uh, to us um, now? And that, like you alluded at the beginning, that's looked different for us at different times. So mm -hmm. There was times where I, based on you know opportunities that were available to us, maybe I had the highest earning capacity. Mm -hmm. um, or um, I had a, a stable earning capacity and uh, we had a very small child at home and uh, it was a great benefit for mom to be able to be there, mm -hmm. you know, in those, in that, those key early um, couple of years of life. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's an interesting thing. I think we want to um, always be asking like, is this the best thing for our family right now? And there's going to be a few different layers to that. How much are we making? Uh, how much time are we spending with our kids? Um, how long will it last? Um, what opportunities does it perhaps lock out in the future? You know, what does it make us say no to now? Mm -hmm. um, but if we're if we challenge our own kind of assumptions and comfort, there's a lot of possibilities, you know. And you know, I, I saw a stat a long time ago. It was like the average person change or has four different careers over the course of their working years, mm -hmm. something like that. So it's not just like flipping from one company to the next, but it's like doing different things. Mm -hmm. So I just always had that in my back in the back of my mind that perhaps, you know, uh, even though I like or love this work, um, I should be open to where uh, my wife's uh, capacities and her uh, unique gifts can bless and benefit the world and provide for our family. So um, I don't know if that answers. That's kind of a bit of a rambling, rambling thing. But um, yeah, I guess I would just say perhaps one question is what is safe? Mm -hmm. um, but then there are other questions we can ask as well. What mm -hmm. will have great impact? Mm -hmm. um, what is really going to build us towards a legacy that we want to leave on the world? Mm -hmm. Speaking of legacies we want to leave on the world, uh, a baby just woke up. So I'm going to go grab her <laughs> and let you take it. And then we'll, we'll, see, we'll, how see, she does. we'll see how she does. The, the you know, uh, these are important things to ponder, especially in um, a time in history where there really is a lot of possibility, right? And, and so there have been times in our marriage where we were aligned and then there were times in our marriage where we definitely were not aligned. And I would say that it was, it came down to communication for us. And there were things that I had in my head that I was not communicating. And there were things that my husband was not uh, in had in his head, but was not communicating. And if you're familiar with my story, you know that I had this huge minivan meltdown when I gave birth to my fourth child in five years, when my husband and I were at a time of extreme tension because work was the only thing taking up my life. And, um, but we were not really communicating. There was sort of just this like, oh my gosh, we're just surviving. And so we have to just keep going, like just keep going, like figure, like get to that next hurdle so that maybe then we'll have a break, but then the never a break never came. And so honey, would you say that that's accurate? Like where it really came down to communication? We both weren't, it wasn't really about the dream. Like it wasn't the dream that was the conflict, 
but that it was the communication around it or was it really like the pursuit of dreams was the thing? Uh, I think alignment, uh, communication is a huge part of it. Um, but um, there, there are other aspects as well. So, so uh, having clarity of where we want to go uh, is a really important thing. So, so in this case, me understanding uh, what Lisa was doing with her business and the impact that it was having and whether or not that could actually um, gain, gain a, a, give us a gainful income. Th those mm -hmm. were important things that I need to know. Husbands, I guess, will, will often um, default to, uh, is this going to take care of the most basic needs of our family? You know, like we don't want to follow a dream that's going to um, come to the detriment where we end up having to, you know, sell our home or whatever like that. We don't want to, mm -hmm. we don't want to have a, we don't want a dream that's going to benefit the world, but uh, bankrupt our family, you know? Um, so I think a husband has to, you know, understand that this is uh, something that we can get behind. And part of that's going to be scale. Like if a husband's leaving his job, he's got to really understand it. Uh, if it's a side passion, he may need to understand it a little bit and get the more clarity over time. Um, but yeah, communication is, is massive. Uh, it's huge. So you bring up an interesting point about leaving a career to support another spouse. So that's something that we've had to navigate a couple times. Um, I think sometimes it was truly situational, meaning it just made sense for me to take a TV contract because of the amount of money that we would make in a short amount of time, wanting to provide stability at home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, in that case, uh, in, in that instance that I'm describing, my husband took paternity leave and was, so was able to return back to his job later. But for the period of time that I was working in, intel in television, he was the primary source of um, childcare. But um, you recently left your, you know, professional career, you know, it, we, this has happened twice in our, in our marriage where you have taken a very, um, I mean, not really sharp detour, but you know what I mean? Like where you have said, okay, I'm no longer going back to like an office. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to work with you. Mm -hmm. And so what, how does, how does one figure that out? I mean, there's a lot of factors, right? And uh, it can help to have good counsel with uh, uh, fr a friend, uh, financial advisor, um, uh, trusted loved ones. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess for us, like I, I wouldn't have done it at a certain point in your, in your career. Um, but as I saw, again, the two pieces, right? The capacity for deep impact in the world, which is something we very much value. You know, as you know, I went to a conference on your behalf about building a, a business, uh, not really knowing why I was there and getting a great deal of clarity at both how this could um, be a business that's, that uh, takes care of our family needs, but also has a real impact on a lot of people. Um, that kind of crucible point um, made it comfortable for me to say, you know what, I'm actually, I'm gonna leave this career. Um, and put a lot more emphasis on the other business or organization we run. I've been lately thinking about this a lot more, but there's really two. You know, there's there's your work, and then there's our big family. Uh, these are two organizations, and they need <laughs> a lot of care. Um, they don't happen by default. As you're as you're hitting at the the moms in the '80s and their feelings about it, it's like no, yeah. we have to treat our family like an organization that can have organizational health or dysfunction. Um, and so anyways, I got comfortable having, I guess, having a little bit of experience of being a stay at home dad when we only had three kids, Ooh, those easy, easy days. Only three. Oh my gosh. To taking on uh, more hours of that in the day, uh, now, and, uh, being able to also, uh, lend some strategy and thoughts, uh, towards, uh, the business that you're building. So, so for anybody who's curious, Josh, what does your day look like? Yeah. So my day, um, uh, some days starts with a very early morning workout. Uh, that's something we've been trying to both uh, emphasize in our lives quite a bit. Um, we'll have uh, on a, when, a, when, a, when it's a good day. Other days we'll have uh, a time time of getting up and having prayer. Um, then uh, the morning rush of getting our kids off to school. And five of our kids are in school and three of our kids are not. Uh, so uh, typically at around nine o'clock, uh, Lisa will start doing her consulting calls or whatever creative work she's on, um, coaching and whatnot. And I will be tending to those three kids. Um, and for a while that was actually basically, that was the whole school day was me and the three kids. Uh, sometimes, you know, God willing, a lunch break, which was really nice. 
Um, but now we've begun to bring in a bit more of a part-time babysitting help. So what's nice is we'll get a babysitter a lot of times like today at 1 p.m. Um, where I can then shift into some of the strategy work, uh, some of the analytics around Lisa's online business, that kind of thing. Um, until it's time for school pickup, and then we have some family time after that. So it's very different than what I used to do, which was clock in at nine, um, you know, do my day, um, clock out at five. Uh, often a lot of travel in the jobs that I've done in the past. Uh, that's 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 different now. Um, so yeah, it's embracing a, a bit of a different thing, which is yeah. So one thing I heard in your response to my question around how we've navigated like pivots and who's the primary breadwinner and whatnot is an understanding of or clarity around legacy. Mm -hmm. uh, you used a different word. I can't remember exactly what you said, but you definitely used the word clarity. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, I don't think I've really reflected on this too much, like in our marriage, but I, I think it bears a short conversation around like, mm -hmm. how do you get united mm -hmm. in that vision mm -hmm. or that, desire for legacy mm -hmm. um, where you can become united in the sense that, hey, if I stay home, this is going to help you build something, you know, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. If we move, you know, for example, if we move to this city, it's going to make it possible for you to take this job in a hospital, whatever, you mm -hmm. know, because it's only there, whatever. So mm -hmm. how does a couple become more well, how does a couple figure it out, number one, like mm -hmm. what they want as a family for their legacy? And then how do you like go about doing it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you use the word communication. That's a really important thing. And sometimes it, it's also not just communicating because it can be hard to get into sort of dream mode um, in the day to day. Like maybe you can, maybe it's like on a date night, you can kind of start to dream. We would periodically, um, you know, when I was working full time, we would do these little weekends away once in a while. They were kind of a mental health break, but then also, um, also a time to just look at like, what would be amazing uh, in life, you know? So we, we dreamt up, I remember one time at a, at a hotel, we dreamt up a home renovation that we were going to do. Yeah. And then because of the, the interior design work Lisa was doing at the time, we were going to try to bring in sponsors so we could actually yeah. afford this thing. Still quite a risk, but it ended up coming to real fruition and raising the property value of our home and us being able to sell it. And then that made some more dreams possible. Um, but um, I guess the key piece was getting away, spending time with one another, um, you know, uh, just, you know, reminding ourselves that like, you know, why we love each other, you know, just having that quality time and then just talking about it, you know, what's amazing in life. What, what, what is, what, where, where are your passions right now? What's bringing you joy? You know, what would you like more of uh, in life and looking at how uh, work uh, and lifestyle, um, you know, supports or is not supporting that. And when you look at what's not supporting that, that can help you decide what to do less of. It might be a job that's really not bringing you a lot of uh, fulfillment. You know, I feel like that's a difficult and over time can become a toxic thing. You know, when you really don't feel valued at work, and you don't enjoy the work that you're doing. Well, if that's not aligned, then what other jobs could be out there? Am I really thinking, you know, about that? Um, and yeah, and it might be a case where it's like, you see one spouse has this amazing opportunity and another spouse kind of likes their job or maybe really likes their job, but you feel like, no, this is actually the better thing. So let's, let's align behind that. So yeah. I got to jump forward a little bit, but it's communication. Okay. And I think communication ha has to happen in the, in the day to day, in the week to week, but also you should think about like how businesses do these retreats because we're going to get out of the regular and we're going to spend some time going deep on something. I think you yeah. should do that in our marriages as well and give ourselves time to dream. Yeah, I think I think you hit the, you know, the nail here on you need space to dream. Uh, for us what that looks like is a very regular date night and what that also looks like is childcare. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it just became very clear to us how important it was to get the quiet and get the rest because I do think that it is more challenging, not impossible, but it is more challenging. Like just think about the regular, um, you know, cacophony of noise mm -hmm. that can cause your looking at you, Colleen, amygdala, if I'm not mistaken, your part of your brain to go into um, fight or flight. Is that the part of your brain? The amygdala? Mm -hmm. or is it the reticular activator? No way. I should know. Amygdala. Yeah. Anyway, part of your brain that goes fight or flight. Um, if you're constantly in fight 
it can be challenging to dream. Like when you're in crisis, it is very difficult to create. And so to get yourself out of that, sometimes, I mean, it doesn't always require childcare. Can you have like a nice date at home? You know, can you have some quiet, have some intentional conversation? Sure. But mm -hmm. I personally do think that childcare is a very essential part of that. And it can be as, you know, as simple as a once a week babysitter. But you brought up like the, the, so would you say that you would see a direct correlation between date night and us? And okay, let me just ask you the question. What would you say, Josh, has been the best outcome or the best result of prioritizing a regular date night? Mm. Uh, it, especially when it's a busy period, it really feels like a, just a recalibration uh, of everything, you know? Um, you love your kids. Of course you do, you know? But you also love each other. And it's really helpful to get out of, again, the ordinary and just sort of dwell with one another and just have time to look each other in the eye and have a conversation that's not cut into, you know, 800 mm -hmm. times. Um, and so I would say I, I would often feel like sometimes I, I would think even I don't have energy for date night. Like, oh, is it worth it? Because I'm already cortisol is already high and I'm already fried. Let me just watch TV. But then you go out and you have date night and you're like, I just had so many times that feeling like, yeah, this was really, um, I didn't realize how much I needed this. This was mm -hmm. really, really helpful. So yeah, mm -hmm. I would say anybody who can find someone they trust to watch their kids uh, once a week, uh, go for a date. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. There's a lot of ways to do it. I know you have a YouTube video uh, on it about the importance of date night with even some cool stats and things they found about strengthening marriage. But um, it uh, is it is it is gold. Um, it is gold. You know, you say you say yes to each other in, in your wedding, and you got to remind yourself of those vows. And the best way, one of the best ways to do that is date night. So I'd say do that, do that stuff. So, and I I think the date night also helps with some of the like small tensions that might exist in marriage. You mm -hmm. know, um, I think intimacy. Mm -hmm also helps mm -hmm. with that too. Mm -hmm. We won't talk about that. Yeah, you have to wait until I'm off screen to talk about that. <laughs> I'm blush. But let's talk about the division of labor, mm -hmm. okay? Michelle is asking a really great question here. How do we create a culture that supports moms and families that doesn't fall back on the mother to be the problem solver? So this is a really interesting question. And you know, uh, as we were talking about earlier with the YouTube video links and showing the result of moms working and what that did then on the home. Um, I have seen in the last 10 years, interesting ad campaigns encouraging dads to do domestic work. Do you remember the one I'm talking about? No. It was for, um, uh, I want to say like, it was a laundry detergent or it, it was either the laundry detergent or it was the washer and dryer company, you know, like, like whatever company it was. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was like, you know, the, the mom was, I think working and then the dad was sitting on the sofa and it was like, I don't know. There was some kind of like, you know, Oh, Hey, like dad can do it. I can't remember if maybe the dad, like the grandfather was also involved. There might've mm -hmm. been a generational thing, but anyways, mm -hmm. long story short, it ended in the dad getting up, doing the laundry, and then the thing at the bottom was like, dads can do laundry too. Mm. I don't know. Kind of patronizing. Well, anyway, I just, <laughs> so, but it is a question that I get asked quite a bit. How do you distribute the work of the home when either both parents are working or one parent is working? Mm -hmm. Does it fall more on one if they're at home? Like these are interesting things to navigate. I, I think um, I think they're um, sensitive things to navigate because I think we have a lot of ideas uh, given to us about um, gender roles. Like I think there's a lot of stuff where it's I think um, there's almost an unhealthy antith antithesis or antagonism towards some of the traditional gender roles. So it's like it almost unconsciously says that the homework is less dignified. Um, hmm. Really the stuff that makes you money and gives you greater freedom individually is more dignified or the more valuable stuff. And the home stuff is not as valuable. And I think this obviously probably people in the audience here know what it's like to be a stay at home. I know what it's like to be a stay at home to some degree. 
Um, that I, I think it's really helpful to think of it as two things as different organizations. You know, mm -hmm. um, there's the organization that gainfully uh, expands your bank account and your capacity to purchase things. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the organization that is your family that's very relational and very important. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, I think that we need to, to, to honor that and realize that every load of laundry is important, you know. Every meal uh, prepared and dishes cleared away is really important. Um, and uh, either spouse can do that. Now, when somebody is, like in, in, in our case, you know, when somebody is showing up for the nine to five more work, then I personally think maybe this is controversial. I don't really see why. Um, the other spouse that is not working those hours can be working other hours in the other organization, which is caring for the kids and, and caring for the home. It's all work. It's all, it's work, all work, you know? And if you're both working half time, then perhaps you're both half time or something like that, you know, without being too fastidious um, in in the kids, you know? And that's important work, you know? And showing up for the kids and being able to let them see your smiling face back on them is really important and indispensable work or unquote to show them what the world is but you know michelle to get back to your comment on the mental load that mothers carry there's also been a lot in the last little while done on mental load and i think i'll be honest with you do you know where we keep the kids birth certificates yes okay but that's not a good example <laughs> hold on do you know I'm, try I'm trying to think of an example that would typically be a mother's mental load mm. to see if he knows it or if he doesn't know mm. it. And to be honest, I'm not coming up with a good example. Oh, because, I'm I'm, because, because I've been Mr. Mom for a little while. Well, I guess so. You know? Anyway. I know how much we spend on groceries. I put on a little laundry before this live. <laughs> you did? I'm rocking it, man. I'm oh. doing it all. Changed a couple diapers. Uh, anyway, you know? <laughs> my point is, is that it's not, this is, it would be naive to say that in many cases, I don't want to generalize completely, but mm -hmm. in many cases, the mom does carry the mental load. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who know, oh, shoot, they haven't been to the doctor. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot. they and, yeah. and I think some of this is, again, like what we're talking about with where is the work being distributed. Mm -hmm. If a dad is doing all the work at work and maybe like just honestly has an intense job and can't, um, you know, doesn't have that much capacity like could maybe could grow in the skill of increasing in details but maybe just is really terrible with details i don't know i'm just making this up right now mm -hmm. um so maybe they don't keep track of all these things i'll be honest here is my this is where i've landed i want a household manager mm -hmm. i don't want any of that in either of our heads do you know what i mean mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. i i i just don't I don't want any of that in either of our heads. So I would prefer to have somebody who like, who changed the furnace filter, mm -hmm. who, um, I don't know. You know what I mean? We need a, we need a, this we need a, a example. we need a, we need, you know, blah, blah, blah needs to go to the doctor. <laughs> right. Okay. So I asked what I was asking for is what's an example of something that's more, um, maybe typically a mom's mental load that maybe a dad wouldn't know. Right. And Michelle is asking, what is your kid's best friend's mom's name? Mm -hmm. And what, okay, mom. so let's do that. I just call What mom. is your kid's best friend's mom's name? Which kid? Okay, so John. Oh. <laughs> it's our baby. Um, John, John's best friend's mom's name. No, I can't. Um, I would just say uh, I don't really answer that. Um, yes, you do. John's best friend. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't recall. Who's John's best friend? Okay, I'm not, do I'm, I, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to test I'm going I'm to shoot the kids up. That's a good point, Michelle. I agree with you. Um, what do they want for the birthday? Again, moms and dads are different in this way too, right? And this is why the, like there's complementarity that is indispensable, I think. When oh my, my kids, gosh. when Lisa says, what do the kids want for the birthday? I just say, like, what size lump of coal or how much coal, basically. It's a bit more of a trash talky thing. Um, let me get rid of these guys. But okay, here's the thing I want to say about this. So that you just witnessed a pretty funny, um, pretty funny thing right there. But does it matter? That's what I want to ask. Does it matter? Does it matter? Like, does it matter that my husband doesn't know my his our oldest son's best friend's mom's name? By the way, you know who it is because we engage with them like every day. I, 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 know, what she, I know what she looks like. Um, 
I know the last name. We engage with okay, her every this day. This does not make sense. This is not a game for time for people <laughs> to fight over whatever. Okay, okay, okay. Things. But my point is, is does it matter? And I'm not trying to. This is Michelle. This is not about you. And and I'm not trying to um get too persnickety or too nitpicky. But I guess what I just want to express is that what serves your family best. Mm -hmm. And that's the question I ask mm -hmm. myself all the time. Right. What serves? What serve? What is the best way I can serve my family right here, right now? So again, to be super honest, we're very transparent here. If you've not watched our videos about mental mm -hmm. illness and marriage, you know, mm -hmm. you you know that you know we are very transparent. And I would say we're pretty honest with each other outside of YouTube videos too. Obviously, like we 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 we've, oh, developed, we've developed a culture of honesty in our family. There are times where I'm sitting down and I'm like, I just wish Josh would take out the garbage. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm sure there are times when we're just sitting down and you're like, oh, I wish Lisa would, you know, pick up the baby. Right. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Not to, I'm not, and I do not have this perfect by any means, but the thing that I try to do is just ask myself the question, like what's going to serve my family best right now. And sometimes it's just taking out the garbage. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, like, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, did you burp again? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to walk off this set unless I start getting some respect. This is, man, talk about gender roles. Honor, honor, <laughs> spouse. But okay, wait. This is a really good conversation we're having. Okay. Don't go anywhere. I won't. I won't bring up your burping again. <laughs> but it's a really good conversation we're having. In in that, what does it look like to serve your family well? Mm -hmm. That's the question I try to ask myself. Does it sometimes mean I do something I don't want to do? Yeah, I think it often does, right? I think it's off. Like I think every day, uh, you know, those those who have kids know every day there's things that you don't want to do. Every day there's things that are this doesn't quite seem fair. Um, Lisa had a really rough morning this week. Um, I can't remember. If if it was after my training day or, or, or what it was, but, um, you were doing more of the, um, the morning stuff. And that involved having to unclog a severely clogged toilet. Oh my gosh. Um, and that, that day started really hard and I'm sure you would have rather, um, just put police tape over the bathroom door and said, no, we don't have that bathroom anymore. It's gone. Yeah. You know, I'll never use that anymore. Um, but you had to roll your sleeves and get into it, you know, um, and that's, that's gross. You know, we both unclogged toilets. It's gross. Um, but o overcoming, I guess, that um, feeling yeah. of this isn't really fair, you know, whatever resentment that kind of come from that has enabled a better functioning home. Right. It's gotten better. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it is fair. It's fair to say, Hey, why am I doing this with myself? Now my kids are fighting and, lunches aren't made and whatnot, you know, there's a fairness. And, and in reality, and our, our marriage is some, sometimes impacted by mental illness and that I am not as with it in the morning uh, as I would like to be, depending on, you know, just being honest, like it's funny if, if I've had anxiety and, and maybe that it manifested in some ins insomnia or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, I, I guess what you're hitting on, and I think it's important, is there's sometimes thing, there's some things that only we can control. You know, mm -hmm. when it comes to managing mental illness in, in marriage, there's things that only I can control um, in terms of setting myself up better. Only I can do certain things that are inside my head. There are certain things that we can control together. Um, you know, Lisa and I, in the way that we manage our schedule, in the way in which we build in buffer, um, the way in which we try to make time for things like day night or or exercise or the things that help. You know, starve the troll with regards to, um, you know, depression, anxiety. And then there's things that only the supporting spouse can control. And that's what I think you were hitting on with regards to your mindset and how you deal with resentment when your spouse is not um, showing up in the way that you would like them to be. You know, if they're if they're if they're if they're lacking in some ways, uh, you know, and maybe maybe for some people that might not be mental illness that's contributing to that, but it might be some other area where like I, I want more of my spouse. Um, but I don't seem to be able to get them to give me what I want. Um, that leaves, I guess, us with a, how do we how do we manage with what we have and honor that person, right? So, what happens though when resentment is prevalent? Like, what, what happens when one spouse is like, "Oh my gosh, I do all the heavy lifting," or "I do blank," or whatever? Like, what? what, what I'm laughing. Our, I'm laughing our infant is right here. 
yeah. being cat yeah. and mousey. And this is a perfect example of, of her role. She's complaining because she wants to be picked up. But when I go to reach for her, she ducks because she's like, I don't want you. I want mommy. You know? <laughs> it's, it's funny that way, right? Um, Hello. But um, Resentment. Yeah. What do you do when one spouse feels like, ugh, I'm carrying like a lot mm -hmm. and they have the thoughts of, I wish my spouse would help out. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? Yeah. Again, it's like there's, there's, there's two parties that can, can approach that. Right. I mean, um, for me, uh, I, I guess I'm at a place where I can, despite, you know, limitations empathize a little bit. So mm -hmm. like taking the, the, that morning this week as an example, I felt remorseful that I wasn't more with it in the morning, you know, mm -hmm. and that you, like, I hate dealing with, I don't know about you. Let us know in the chat. Do you like dealing with human feces? <laughs> I don't personally love it. Um, I don't, I don't like the smell of it. I don't like, you know, that it could splash on you. It's really gross to unclog toilets. Let us, let me know if that's just me. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. So in, in a perfect world, um, I suppose can empathize and maybe make some changes, you know, uh, today I was feeling really tired for other reasons, but, uh, you know, got up because I didn't want Lisa to have to do the morning by herself. Um, hope, hopefully that's like, that's what a spouse can do when uh, frustration is communicated. Um, you could probably answer better, Elise, uh, for the person who's feeling the resentment. Um, what what can they do? Like, what is, what is a way to healthily communicate it to a spouse that you are feeling? honest resentment uh towards or about um or about their behavior um and what can you do when perhaps that might even not re garner the the response that we had hoped and there's still resentment there i mean i'll be honest with you i think what i'm about to say might be mildly controversial but we'll just what else is now i <laughs> i personally think resentment is a choice now that doesn't take away from the feelings that you might have, like, I'm really tired, for example, I'm really tired. There's a lot on my plate. We've got to figure out a way, like, can we figure out a way to make dinner go more smooth, bedtime more smooth, whatever, like mm -hmm. whatever it is. So that, that you don't want to, I'm not trying to discount and, and gloss that over. There, there is pain reveals something, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime there is some kind of pain, it reveals something that perhaps we want to deal with, right? And so I think resentment in marriage is no different. Like if you're starting to feel resentment, it can be a nice little sort of like alarm, you know, alarm bell mm -hmm. of, oh, okay, there's probably something in here that needs to be addressed. And and I think you can still do that. You know, I still think I, I think you can um take the problem like the morning is chaos on my own. Mm -hmm. What systems can we, you know, put into place, you know, whatever, um, so that perhaps it's not so chaotic. I think we can also, you know, acknowledge when something is a more unique situation, all those kinds of things. But I, I do think that exactly as Michelle is saying here in the chat that, you know, resentment is a choice and forgiveness is a choice. Like we, mm -hmm. we get to decide um what thoughts occupy our time if you have not yet watched my episode with my mindset coach Erin Ingold I want to encourage you to go back and watch that it's episode two of the possibility mom live right mm -hmm. and she talks about how thoughts are like sentences in your brain and how you can just like like a whiteboard that's been the analogy that I've been using quite a bit visually mm -hmm. is that like a whiteboard you can kind of just wipe it away mm -hmm. and so you know it's not to diminish the pain or the struggle or the real feelings that somebody might have, but that you can stay there or you can also wipe that thought away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speaking of wipe, uh, bless this mama agreed poop is gross. And I appreciate uh, the uh, support there. So many of you, uh, or jo Josh, many of the YouTube audience here knows you mm -hmm. from the videos that we've created mm -hmm. around mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do get asked quite a bit mm -hmm. how you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share how Florida has impacted your, um, 
your journey with mental illness? Yeah, uh, totally. Uh, now, Florida doesn't cure everything. Obviously, there's people that have uh, mental illness down here. The sun uh, works wonders, but uh, there's, you know, uh, the reality is, is, is mental illness is often something that's managed, not necessarily uh, fixed or cured. But um, I would say um, aspects of our life design, including moving to Florida, have helped me in a number of ways. Um, other things that have had an impact, uh, you know, we've both been prior prioritizing exercise a lot more, working with a trainer, which has been great. Um, you know, um, doing some CrossFit style workouts, which is like, you basically just get destroyed for an hour and then you feel great, except very sore for a few days afterwards. It's really lovely. Um, trying to do a good job with, in terms of like nutrition and, and preparing, you know, natural foods and all this stuff. And so these things I think have been having an impact for sure. Um, still good days and bad, you know, I still don't necessarily feel like, um, yeah, it's not like I felt like, uh, that, that, um, mental illness is, is something in the rear view, but something that, uh, has a, a quieter voice perhaps than, um, than it has at other times in my life. So yeah, I, I would say, man, we, uh, we love Florida. We love being down here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, tri but the triggers are, are still there, you know. Um, I can't necessarily go all in seven days a week and not feel a real toil over time. I need rest. I need to pay attention to my sleep. I need to pay attention to quiet time and all that stuff. So that's, that's all still there, you know. Um, but despite all that, you know, I feel like, I feel like life is good, you know. And um, well, we're, great, we're grateful for that, you know. So, yeah. What else do you want to share about the pursuit of dreams as a couple? even in the midst of <laughs> juggling? Um, I would say that it's important for, uh, this is just coming to mind, but I think it's important to have shared dreams and also individual dreams. Um, should I go into to another screen? Or should we let, oh, yeah. we're gonna wrap up soon. Yeah, so I would say shared dreams but individual dreams. You know, it's great to have things Here, that- you, is, you talk. Okay. Oh wow! You talk. Wow! Look at this. <laughs> I'm I'm hosting the Possibility Mom live. Look at me! Wow! <laughs> Check it out. Hey, ladies. Um, I would say I think it's really important to have uh, shared dreams. So we talked about that with regards to Lisa's work. I really much, very, I very much believe in it. I I love the idea of the impact that it has and the and the impact I've seen it have. Um, so there's that, but I think it's also important for spouses to have uh, their own dreams and to pursue their own passions. And so, um. You know, whether that's uh, a girls' night, you know, Lisa does a Bible study with some other ladies in town. I think that's great. Uh, sometimes I'm tired and I don't want her to go away, but it's, uh, you know, I try to support that. Um, you know, I have some I have some dreams with regards to, it's funny, but I've, I've been picking up uh, some woodworking. And I'm not a handy guy, but I built my own squat rack in the gym, starting to work with my hands a little bit more. Um, I think it's important to be, you know, growing in different areas, always kind of not like letting ourselves um become a snapshot in time, but recognizing that we are growing and developing in different ways throughout the course of our life. Um, so I would say, yeah, maybe you need to both cultivate your own dreams and encourage your husband to cultivate his dreams because sometimes we get in a rut, you know, and and, and we lose, we lose uh, the habit of doing some things that really matter. Um, so encourage your spouse to dream, I would say as well. Um, and I, I guess the last thing would just be that dreams can change, change over time. Sometimes there's sort of a core, but it, it, it manifests in different ways. Uh, over time. So uh, try to be flexible and uh, not project forever into the future that this is how um, this has to go because I dreamt it would look this way a long time ago. Maybe there's something underneath or within that dream, which is kind of the core of it, but it's actually going to look and take different shapes at different times. So there's some thoughts. Yeah. Who's our guest next week, Josh? Uh, our guest next week is the amazing and talented and lovely Anna Saussure, uh, a good friend of Lisa's. And Anna runs a membership uh, community for um, women who are uh, fertility practitioners, teaching women how to uh, understand their bodies. I can't believe I'm pitching this. It's kind of funny. <laughs> but uh, Anna Saussure, wonderful person. We're really excited to have what her are we during this to week. Her about? Uh, about managing a business, about knowing your body, and about the possibility of. Uh, creating a different story for your family than is perhaps normal. Anna and her husband uh, and their small children uh, had a bit of a dream to uh, work remotely and they have truly done that. They live in different countries at different times. They just, they, they, they hired a, I guess an au pair, like a child support and that helps them 
give their kids an experience like living in Asia, living in Mexico, you know, the U.S. where they're from, kind of bouncing around, which is really cool, you know. So living in a way outside the box by building uh, a business and uh, supporting people and helping their lives get better. So I think she's going to be an awesome guest. I don't know if Lisa said this, but I actually work with her on the show in terms of sometimes recruiting guests, inviting them, and finding stories for her to talk about. So it's fun to work together, you know. What's your favorite thing about working with your wife? I thought we were going to talk more about the challenges of working together. I feel like that's like another episode because it's interesting when you work with your spouse on something. Sometimes you get things that are, um, they seem like business disagreements and it turns out they, they turn into marital disagreements. So I thought that'd be an interesting to talk, thing to talk about. Um, but uh, what's fun about working with my wife, it's neat that she's always a stone throw away and we get to see each other on breaks and have little coffee breaks and bone broth. I think she just what, wants me to say nice things about her. What's most annoying about working with your wife? When she just, you know, uh, what's annoying about working with my wife is when she just yells questions at me from, <laughs> from the bed over there nursing the child. Anyways, friends, hope this was fun and enjoyable to you. Let us know in a comment, share it with a friend, uh, you know, another mom who's got big dreams, if you like. And thanks for putting up with me, uh, filling in for the last, um, for the last uh, few minutes here. Um, but yeah, keep pursuing those dreams, ladies, and uh, with your spouse, dream together. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, guys, God bless. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.